And I can see why God uh, had us gain certain experiences and, and involved in certain things. And so I appreciate that. Uh, through some unfortunate events, again, had to make some hard decisions. <laughs> had to make some hard decisions and felt the pull of God to relocate and start work down in Columbus, Ohio, and really and truly against all the odds. Amen. Uh, no, no support really anywhere. Me and another brother and his family. Amen. And uh, he's not here tonight. I don't, I don't think, I don't know if he'll be here tonight, but I, I, I'm going to pick on him a little bit. If you're ever going to start a work, you, if you've done it, you know you, you need some, there's, there's, there's valuable support along the way. And uh, this brother was a man full of faith. And uh, everybody else might have been discouraged, and he was encouraged. <laughs> Amen. Everything else looked like disaster. Things are great. <laughs> you know? And you need that yeah. in those moments and in those times. Amen. And I appreciate how God just put the pieces together. And I thank God for the land I hold today. Amen. Amen. I appreciate God's goodness. We still need God tonight just as much as we ever have. We need him more tonight than we've ever needed him before. We appreciate the saints here, the invitation to come, enjoying the, the little experiences we've had. We have enjoyed the sweet spirit, the good spirit, the right spirit and the fellowship of the saints, and we're looking for that to continue, amen, and to move forward. Some of the thoughts presented here tonight as we move into the message may not be thoughts that have traditionally been taught, and I am not here tonight to shove anything down your throat. I am not here tonight to make you accept or try to make you accept anything. I'm asking you to consider. I'm just asking that you consider these things tonight. I'm not saying that by the time you walk out of here, we're going to be agreed on every point. Probably won't. Amen. And it tends to be with revelation. When you start preaching along those lines, there are a lot of different ideas out there. Um, I am not here tonight to o argue over symbols, over prophetic interpretation. Uh, I might even get some of that wrong in your estimation tonight. But I pray that you catch the spirit of the message. That you catch the spirit of the message and if you know anything about the landscape, and I'm not talking about just the religious landscape, but the Church of God landscape, you know that there's trouble. And I think if we're just honest with ourselves, we know that there has been a lot of damage that has been done under the name Church of God. So, as it is, I am not here to preach to beat the air. I'm not here, I don't believe in preaching that gets nowhere. And I, I believe that a lot of the preaching on Babylon in the church has not really gotten us very far. Right. Amen. Because we are preaching to, uh, to an audience that is not sitting before us. Right. Right. Most of the time we're preaching about Babylon in a, in a context right. and to an audience that's nowhere near us. Right. And there's nothing wrong with that to some degree. We need to know truth. Right. And there, there's... Uh, for instance, we, we pride ourselves in teaching holiness and living free from sin, and that's a right message. And so don't get me wrong tonight, I believe that message, and I believe that's an important message. And I know that most of the religious world tonight believes that you can't live a life that is free from the power of sin. Amen? But I also realize that we can glory in that truth to the neglect of glaring issues that are right among us. And we pride ourselves because we have this truth that we can't even see ourselves. Amen. And so God is trying at this time, I believe, to show the church of God the church of God. Amen. So you pray for us tonight. You prayerfully consider these things. We've been asked to preach along the lines of the eighth beast and felt burdened and pressed of God to do so. And um, I asked my congregation this when I first began preaching along these lines. Been around the Church of God a long time. I've been around the Church of God my whole life. Been brought to her in a blanket. How much preaching you heard on the eight beasts? How much? Because I didn't hear a whole lot. I didn't hear a whole lot. If you were asked most people around the church, what's the eighth beast? I think you'd get a pretty generic answer. Um, but we're going to go a little deeper tonight with it. I believe God has some truths for us to consider. Some truths for us to consider. But we'll be primarily focusing on the eighth beast. And I say that the eighth beast, but... There's another aspect to this when teaching on the eighth beast, and this will be prevalent over the next couple days. There was somebody sitting on the eighth beast, and you cannot preach on the eighth beast unless you address who was sitting 
on that eight beast. Uh, amen. So those are going to go hand in hand tonight. We are going to try to primarily set the groundwork for the what the eighth beast is. Identify that. Define that. You pray for us that uh, this is this is difficult to, to preach this series in three messages. Amen. It is hard, and we've had to get before God. And so some this will not be exhaustive tonight. Uh, but I, I believe you'll catch the spirit of the message. Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. We covet your prayers. Verse number one, there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Madeline the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven horns, seven heads, and ten horns. As we start in verse number one, it's important to know the time period in which this is taking place. Amen. And I don't have the luxury tonight of breaking down every symbol, but I'll do my best to, to try to explain in some of this as we go. There came one of the seven angels, and we know the angels are representative of a ministry, a messenger. Amen. But it was a particular ministry. Amen. That came to John. It says, which had the seven vials. Amen. That had the seven vials. And if you will, if you would go over, we don't need to turn there now. But if in Revelation 15, we get an introduction to the uh, to the vile ministry, to the vile angels. And it would let us know that in these vials, which are more like bowls. Amen. Within these vials were filled up. The wrath of God, or in other words, the judgments of God. And those angels were instructed to pour, not drip out, not sprinkle out, but to pour those vials out or to pour the judgments of God out upon a very particular place. Amen. The earth. Pour the vials out upon the earth. So pour the judgments of God out upon the earth. And you got to understand that, amen, earth is represented of earthen vessels, men, humanity, the minds of men, the ideas of men. And amen, that is characterized by another beast, a, a system that came up out of the earth, which was the system of Protestantism. Protestantism came up out of the minds of men, out of the ideas and the opinions of men. And those ideas and those opinions caused them to break off into different factions and into different groups. But it came a time where God called a ministry and he gave them some judgment. And he said, I want you to pour it out upon the earth. I want you to pour it out on that which has produced a system that is not of God, that has produced division, that has produced denominations. Amen. And so in 1880, God called a ministry, amen, that would pour the vial out, the count a message, to come out of those groups, to come out of those denominations, to forsake those creeds, amen, and to leave them and take a stand for the church, which was not a geographical location, wasn't another group, but the church that Jesus purchased with his own blood, that when you repent of your sins and turn from everything you know to be wrong, in that moment, in that split second, amen, you became a part of the church. That's what the church of God's all about tonight. Amen. 
Amen. But what happened? Men's ideas and opinions and traditions and ideas caused people who had a born again experience to not be able to enjoy sweet fellowship with one another. Amen. Because of who they were associated with. Amen. And I want that point to be driven home tonight. Amen. Because as much as we like to relegate that, amen, out to the Protestant world as we have traditionally known it, amen, that spirit is alive and well in people that call themselves the church of God. There are people that have a born-again experience but can't enjoy sweet fellowship one with another because of who they're associated with. And that's just the truth tonight. Amen. Go back over to Revelation 16. We'll be back here in 17, but got to drive a few things home tonight. He says, I heard a great voice out of the temple saying, we're in verse 1, saying to the seven angels, go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. The first went. So how do you know, Brother Nathan, that this is talking about the evening time? How do you know? Because of where he poured the vial out. Amen. I can look and know the, the prophetic time period. Amen. Because I got to see where the vial was poured out. Where was the judgment put? The first went and poured out his vial upon the earth. And there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast. And upon them which worshipped his image. Amen. Uh, Revelation 13 and verse 11. So this vile angel went and poured it out upon the earth. Amen. And poured it upon those which had the mark of the beast and worshiped the image of the beast. Amen. And verse, um, verse number 11, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. Looked good. Looked like Christ. Looked Christian. Looked godly. But he spake, he spake as a dragon, amen, a beast that came out of the earth. Well, when did this beast come up out of the earth? Protestant period, 1730. When did judgment begin to get poured out, amen, on this old Protestant system? 1880, the evening time. So when we're dealing, and this is the point we want to make tonight, amen, when we're dealing with a vile ministry, we're dealing with evening time. We're dealing with evening time. We're not back here in the morning time. Amen. We're not back here in the dark ages. But brother, when the vile angels are pouring out the judgments of God, it is always a picture of the evening time. Now I want you to notice. Go back to 17, verse number 1. There came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials. Can you notice he didn't tell us which one? You notice he didn't tell us which vile angel showed it to him? I'll tell you why tonight. It didn't matter. It did not matter. Because the same vials, the same judgments that needed to be poured out in 1880 need to be poured out in 2023. Listen, to deny the message we're preaching tonight, you are going to have to deny the conditions. Brother, to deny the condition, to, if, if you are going to deny the message that is preached tonight, you are telling me that the church of God tonight is operating at the level of the book of Acts. And I don't think any of us are prepared to make that statement tonight. The conditions speak for themselves. And it is time for a ministry to speak to the conditions. We can preach against Babylon till we're blue in the face. We can preach against the Baptists and the Methodists and the United Brethren and those poor, lost, deceived people over there. But I'm telling you tonight, it is time to show the house to the house. Amen. To show Jerusalem her transgression. To show Judah her sin, brother. Amen. For too long, the church of God has gloried in her doctrine. She's gloried in her truth. She's gloried in her standards. All the while, becoming no different than the Babylon they're preaching against. Amen. Revelation 14, verse number 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion. Brother, that's where the lamb's at, brother. Amen. 
Amen. You want to get in the, you want to, amen. Listen, I'll tell you what church to, to be a part of. Be a part of the one where the lamb's standing. Amen. amen. You, you don't follow a man tonight. You don't follow a camp meeting tonight. You don't follow a group tonight. You better stand with the lamb. You say, Brother Nathan, what camp are you a part of? The camp of the saints tonight. I ain't got a camp. I don't got a group. I don't got a certain ministry I associate with, brother. Amen. I'm in fellowship tonight with every blood-washed one because they're my family tonight. Amen. The Lamb shed his blood for them just as much as he shed it for me tonight. You know you don't have a choice tonight who you're in fellowship with. Amen. I have a sibling, and I've said it many times. I have a sibling. I, no one consulted me about whether or not I wanted that sibling to be a part of the family. Nobody. My parents didn't ask me. Amen. I had to deal with it. And listen, if someone is born again tonight, you just got to deal with it. Amen. And it shouldn't be hard if you got the same blood. Amen. I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him, 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Amen. Why you go with the name Church of God? Because that's the name of the church, brother. Amen. The one that has the Father's name. Amen. Brother, amen. I want to be identified with God's family. Amen. The church of God. Amen. What are we getting a picture here in Revelation 14? Amen. We have a picture of the evening time ministry finally getting into the same position the Lamb is standing on. They're standing with the Lamb. All Revelation 13 taught us about the beast. Then it went into the image of the beast. we got to go through papalism and then Protestant. But finally in Revelation 14, we get a picture of some people that are standing with the Lamb on Mount Zion. They had come out of the dark night. They had come out of the dark and cloudy day. Amen. And they were standing with the Lamb. Amen. The Son of God. Amen. The Son. Amen. Where light was breaking. Where light was shining. Amen. And were able to enjoy their freedom. That happened in the evening time, brother. Amen. Go with me to verse number 6. Down a few verses. I saw Revelation 14, verse 6. And I saw another angel. Fly in the midst of heaven. Amen. I thank God he ain't talking about the celestial heaven. Amen. He's not talking about the heaven up there in the eternal, brother. He's talking about a ministry that can fly. Amen. In the heavenly Jerusalem. Amen. Has raised us up to sit together in heavenly places. Amen. Brother, I'll tell you what the problem is with Babylon today. The ministry can't fly. They have clipped the wings of the ministry today. Amen. They can't fly in the midst of heaven. Brother, I want to be in a place where the ministry is allowed to fly. Amen. You can touch that corner. You can touch that corner. You can come cover that. You can move that out of the way. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Amen. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. What he has? The everlasting gospel to preach. To where? To the conditions. Unto them that dwell on the earth. Amen. And to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Different denominations. Different groups. Where God's people were. He gave that ministry a message. Amen. That identified what Babylon was. Amen. Identified what Babylon was. And also what to do about that condition. What is the condition of Babylon? It's fallen. Babylon is fallen. Stop thinking about Babylon as the Pentecostals. Stop thinking about Babylon just with the United Brethren and the Methodists and the Baptists. Brother, for it to have fallen, it had to have been up. For it to have fallen, it had to be up. What makes something Babylon? It failed, brother. It failed. They had truth. They had the Spirit of God. They had the Word of God, and they fell. And when it falls, you rest assured, I don't care if they have Church of God above the door tonight, it is falling as sure as I'm standing up here before you tonight. And there's only one thing to do when something is falling. And then and the Bible never said to go get some bricks and a hammer and start trying to build it back up. Brother, he said, come out of her. Amen. You know why you can't stay down there? Because God's not down there. That's why it failed. That's 
why it's in the condition it's in. Amen. Today, people are trying to reform what cannot be reformed. They're trying to bring congregations back. They're trying to bring movements back. They're trying to bring camp meetings back. Got some kind of sentiment about the good old days, brother. Amen. I'll tell you, those days are gone, gone, gone. The Spirit of God has departed, and God is raising up a new thing. Amen. Amen. Listen, I'm not interested in trying to rekindle some sentiment tonight. Amen. I want the glory of God. Amen. They had the everlasting gospel to preach. And one of the things they told that, uh, that ministry, God told that ministry, was fear God. Not the people. Not the elders. Not the creeds of men. Not me. Don't glorify men. Church of God is, man, we are the glorifiers of men if I've ever seen it, brother. We lift up ministers. We lift up places. We lift up people. Amen, brother. Look at where it's got us. Amen. Whenever you exalt men, even good men. Amen. Even good men. Above the word of God and the spirit of God, you are primed for the fall tonight. Amen. For the hour of his judgment had come. Amen. When did it begin? When did the hour of God's judgment begin? At the evening time. Amen. That's when it came. Amen. In the evening time. Amen. In Revelation 14, 9, it says, The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. Amen. That's who the third angel there in Revelation 14 was put in judgment on. Amen. Those that worshiped the beast and his image. All right. Back to 17.1. We're dealing with the evening time ministry. We've nailed down. It's, it started in the sixth seal in the beginning of the evening time. But as we study this eighth beast, we are getting down to the period right before the close of time. Because as he talks about this eighth beast, and we'll study a little more maybe tomorrow night. But it says this beast goeth into perdition. Brother, this is the last beast before eternity. And this is what's so troubling to me, church. This is the beast of our age. We as the church of God claim that anyways. We, we, we believe that, that the eighth beast is our battle. And we intimate that this is the greatest beast of them all. That this is the most serious, this is the amalgamation of every opposing spirit that has ever come against the church. And it concerns me how little preaching we hear about it. Amen. Amen. It concerns me that the people really have no idea what we're talking about today. What a deception by the devil. Amen. To be able to put a beast upon us and get us hush mouth about it. Real quiet about it. Don't say nothing about it, brother. Amen. Listen, the time has come. To rip the cloak, amen, off this thing and identify it for what it is. This eighth beast is not the World Council of Churches tonight. This eighth beast is not just ecumenicalism, where you have the Baptist and the Catholic and the Hindu and the Buddha all coming together. It's more than that tonight. It's more, and maybe I'll just get a little ahead of myself here, but when John looked at that beast, when he looked at that beast and he saw the woman, the Bible says he wondered at her. He looked at her with great admiration. Amen, great admiration. Listen, John had already seen this beast. John had already seen that beast. John had already seen that beast. But when he got to this beast, it took a message and a messenger to reveal to him what he was looking at. That tells me it wasn't just this, this, and this coming together, brother, or else he would have known what he was dealing with, brother. He would have known, and he wouldn't have admired it. He wouldn't have admired it. He looked at the beast and the woman, and he wondered after him. Amen. It took him, and the angel had to shake him up. What you doing? Why are you marveling? I'm about to, sh I got to show you something. Listen, I got to show you something. I got to show you something. Go down to verse 3. We're going to go back up in a minute. But the angel, talking about the angel, so he carried me away in the spirit. Carried him away 
in the spirit. So what's that telling us? First of all, I want you to notice, John could not get the revelation where he currently was. He had to change positions. The angel said, look, I can't show you here. And brother, some people are never going to see Babylon as long as they're where they're at. Why? The ministry ain't showing them anything there. Amen. It's just a general fluffy, amen, gospel, sugar-coated, brother. Live easy. Amen. Just be a good moral person. Amen. Just be a good citizen. Pay your taxes. Amen. Be a conservative or whatever, brother. Amen. And go to church every Sunday and bring your family and this, that, and the other. And it's one big social gathering today. Amen. It is not preparing people for the reality of that we're facing spiritually tonight. Listen, church ain't no social gathering tonight. Amen. And tonight, let me just get on this for a minute. Amen. While I'm at it, the church, amen, is starting to look more like the world. Amen. It's starting to associate more like the world. They do the same thing the world's doing. They go the same places the world goes. They dress the same way the world dresses. They're entertained by the same things the world's entertained by, and they don't want the preacher to say nothing about it. Amen. Brother, this old school gospel will still get the job done. Amen. Brother, we don't identify with the world. We don't look like the world. We don't act like the world. We don't talk like the world because our identity is with Christ. When the world looks upon us, nothing but Christ should be in view. And the church of God tonight is looking more like great Babylonian churches than it is a separate and distinct people. Amen. That have the presence of God. I've never seen people compromise and keep the power of God. No, sir, brother. Amen. They're relying on the weak arm of flesh for everything today. Amen. They can't hardly trust God for anything today. Amen. And I'll tell you why. Amen. It is because they have lost the presence of God among them because they have traded, they have sacrificed the spirit of God for the spirit of the world. That wasn't in my notes, but that was free tonight. Amen. John had to change positions to see her. He had to change. And listen to me. Church of God, amen, I'm not here tonight to tell each individual person what they need to do. I trust the word of God goes forth here. Amen. I appreciate that tonight. Amen. But I know there's some in this state. Ah. Uh, amen. In this state. And that's still being a little prod. Amen in this state that need to change positions. The spirit of God ain't down there. Brother, as I travel across the country, going from place to place, and as I said in our own congregation, not just physically traveling, but brother, everybody's on Facebook and YouTube today. Amen. Amen. These saints today, they'll advertise what they are. Amen. And brother, I'm telling you, the power of God is almost altogether lost in most of what calls itself the church of God. Divine healing. Anybody seen it lately? And brother, I'm not here to condemn. I'm not here to criticize tonight. But that belongs to us, Church of God. Where are the miracles? Where are the gifts? Come on, brother. These are the things that we should be contending for. And if you're in a place that is not contending for the faith, once delivered to the saints, I got one message for you tonight. You need to change positions. Amen. He said, come hither. Amen. Go up to verse number one. Which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying to me, come hither. I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore. And brother, as much as I believe that the beast is a part of this message, the great whore was the first thing that the angel told John, I got to show you. I got to show you this great whore. I got to reveal this thing to you. Listen, something obvious doesn't need revealed. Something obvious doesn't need revealed. She was not obviously a harlot. She didn't look like a harlot. She didn't present herself like a harlot. Amen. And I'm not being critical tonight. I said about my chart too. But brother, we probably need to change what she looks like on a lot of our charts. Amen. Because I'm going to tell you exactly what she looked like. She looked like the church of God. She looked like the pure bride of Christ. And that might tell us tonight why John marveled. 
looked at her with great admiration, maybe a little foreshadowing here. Why does it look like the church of God? Because what she had on. She had pearls. Pearls are truth. Pearls are truth. This is a woman, this is a harlot, but she had truth. She had gold. The golden candlestick, that's the church, brother. She looked like, she appeared like the church. She had stones, precious stones. That means she even had some saints of God. You've been made lively stones. You've been made living stones. Amen. By the, by the stone. Amen. Born again, you became a lively stone. But there were some people that were down there associated with this harlot because she had truth. Amen. She had the understanding of the church. And she had some good saints down there. Amen, brother. She looked a lot like the church of God. She looked an awful lot like the church of God. Amen. This woman in this chapter is characterized as sitting on mountains, sitting on the beast, and sitting on waters. Now, we know that she isn't sitting on all three at the same time. The Bible is trying to convey something to us. It's trying to convey something to me. To us. Amen. Sitting upon many waters. Revelation 17, 15 lets us know that the waters are people. And brother, I want to tell you that's the most alarming thing of it all. Is that precious souls are holding up this woman. Holding up this church of God. Amen. She also sat upon a beast. We know what a beast is. It's a man-made system. It's a system. Just like this Protestant beast. Just like this other, uh, the, the papal beast. Amen. Uh, paganism. These were systems of religion. Amen. So it was religious. Mountains are places of worship. Amen. Uh, it says in the last days that the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountain. And all nations shall flow unto it. Amen. And we know that in God's mountain they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. But there's also mountains. Amen. And they're not worshiping in spirit and in truth. Amen. They're places of worship. Amen. Jesus told the woman at the well. She said, look, our fathers worshiped in this mountain. He said, look, the hour is coming and now is. Amen. That the true worshipers aren't going to worship in this mountain, brother. They're going to worship God in spirit and in truth. Mountains depict to us places of worship. So this woman was being promoted by people, by places of worship. By a religious system. Amen. Amen. The woman was sitting upon the waters. Something that comes up out of waters or being prompted or promoted by waters, that's no good, brother. That is no good. Isaiah 57 20 says, The wicked are like the troubled sea. When it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. Amen. When Revelation 8, verse number 8, it says, When the second angel sounded, it, as it were, a great mountain, burning with fire, was cast into the sea. But, brother, it's not just what goes in, but it's what comes up. Amen. Listen, when you lose the Spirit of God, it's not that you just go under and go into oblivion, but it's what you replace it with. Tonight, people have, have, are trying to replace the, uh, the, the, the power and the glory of God with cheap substitutes. Yeah. Trying to still claim their heritage and their history and this person and that person. Brother, listen, if the spirit of God is not there, amen, it is gone, it is done. There's no need trying to be there anymore. And I talk to people all across the country. Brother Nathan, isn't there any hope for some reform? Amen. Isn't there any hope that I could be the good influence down there? I've heard that one. What a lie of the devil, brother. Amen. I'll be the good influence down there. and I'll be the good part. And I'll help be. Brother, I've seen everybody that do that. They go under. They go under. Eventually they just. And brother, the things they used to be troubled about, they're not troubled about anymore. The things that used to bother them and convict them and disturb them and they call you about. They'd almost be more disturbed than you were. Yeah. Amen. Tonight, they don't even want to talk about it. I don't even want to talk about church stuff. Don't talk to me about church stuff. Amen. They've settled for something, brother. 
Amen. Paul talked about, sorry, people caused the mountain to be extinguished. It quenched the spirit, and the beast rose up out of the sea. It was a result of apostasy. Paul warned of this apostasy. He said, after my departing, shall grieve his wolves, enter in among you, not sparing the flock, also of your own selves. Amen. Shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. What I am trying to show to you tonight is that this beast, this beast, and this beast is nothing more than a people that had fallen, had backslidden, and became apostate. <laughs> amen. These are people. Amen. Listen, apostasy never comes from the outside. If there's an, any congregation that goes under, any movement that has ever gone under, brother, I'm going to guarantee you, it came from among them. It was from among their own. Amen. Let a good man of God go off the scene. Come on, brother. Let a good man of God go off the scene and summarize. Amen. What happened when Paul and John and Peter and those brethren began to go off the scene from among the people? Amen. There was among the people. Amen. There were teachers, amen, men of influence who brought in what? Damnable heresies. Amen. Somebody's responsible tonight. Somebody's responsible tonight. Listen, all this division and confusion in the land tonight, amen, brother, there is a cause. It's not even that confusing tonight. Men have destroyed, amen, what some have labored with all their blood, sweat, and tears to build for God. This woman was sitting on waters. Waters are people. The beast that came out of a massive body of water, the sea, was nothing more than an apostate people. They weren't the pagans. They weren't the pagans. Amen. It was those from among them. It was those who claimed to be saints. This is the first description we get where the woman is sitting, and under this woman is ultimately people and its souls. So we don't preach this message tonight just to show off some knowledge and some understanding. That's why I'm not here to argue about this or that, brother. There are souls that are going to be lost. There are souls that are going to miss heaven. There are souls that are going to die, shrivel up and die in a place where the Spirit of God is not at. They're going to get deceived, amen, and not even know they're not saved until they split hell wide open one day. This message is a necessity tonight. And, brother, may God begin to loose some more angels, brother. Amen. To herald this message. Amen. This is the message of the hour. Brother, listen. There's all this talk today. Amen. That this isn't the message of the hour. I'm so tired of hearing about come out. And I'm so tired of hearing about battle. And brother, I want to tell you tonight. Amen. Somebody at a meeting just recently. Amen. Came up to me and said, Brother Nathan, I'm so tired of hearing about come out. Amen. Just preach the basics. Just preach the basics. Amen, brother. Last I checked, Revelation was in the Bible. Amen. And the Bible says, Blessed is he that heareth, readeth, and keepeth the words of this prophecy. I'm not against preaching fundamentals. I'm not against preaching the basics. Amen. But don't do it at the neglect of the whole counsel of God. There are some messages that are good for time, brother. Amen. The message of go ye into all the world and preach the gospel still stands tonight. And I'm not negating that message. That is a message for anyone bound by sin tonight. Amen. That you can be loose from the bondage of sin. That God can deliver you. If you'll repent and do business with God even tonight, God will save you. Amen. You don't even have to wait till the altar call. If you want to be saved tonight, this is your moment. This is your time. That message is the right message. It's the message of all time, brother. And that will never change. But there has never been a time where God has left the church without a message. Amen. And God has a message for the church. Amen. God has a message for the church at this time, at this hour. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. I'm not going to go there tonight, but Revelation 3 is our letter there in Laodicea. It was no good, brother. That was a rough letter. We got, we got, we got F's in every category on our report. That's the only letter where we didn't.
didn't get encouragement one time. We didn't get commended for anything we were doing, brother. And we got preachers today that just want to be positive and encourage you. Just, just keep, you know, just keep it simple and keep it general, brother. It's time to preach it just like Jesus preached it to the church. I'm not trying to discourage you tonight, but I ain't going to encourage you when you shouldn't be encouraged. Amen. All right, 17.3, Revelation 17.3. So he carried me away in the spirit in the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So we get a picture of the woman sitting on this beast. There's no denying tonight that this description of, her, of this beast having seven heads and ten horns is something Roman. I, I ain't denying that tonight. But brother, this isn't the Roman Catholic Church of the Vatican. Okay, we're not dealing with the actual Pope, per se. We're dealing with something far more serious tonight. Amen, listen. The Pope over there in Italy don't even know who the Church of God is. They don't know us. And they ain't worried about us. And they don't care tonight, brother, what we're doing over here. So, so you sit here with your big bad self talking about how you're fighting the Vatican, brother. You are beating the air tonight. But the Vatican is not over there in Italy. It's right here. It's right here. When the come out message came out in 1880, it wasn't just the saints who came out. unclean spirits like frogs responded to the message by God as well. Amen. And they came out and they went forth. They didn't stay down there and rank denominationalism, brother. They didn't stay down there, amen, and rank amen, babbling. But they came out to what? To deceive. Listen, the people down there that teach you can't live free from sin, they're already deceived, brother. They're already deceived. We pray God lift that deception from them. Amen. But if it's going out to deceive, it's a people who have truth. This beast shows a relationship to something Roman. When depicting the beast that came out of the sea, it was identified as having seven heads and ten horns. But when it was depicted as coming up out of the sea, it had crowns on the heads. This tells us that this wasn't just a religious rule but it was a political one. And Roman Catholicism in that time did work through the power of the state. Through the power of the state. But as we get down here to something that is being described Roman, there's a notable omission. I don't see any crowns. The Bible doesn't say anything about the crowns. There are no crowns on this beast. So that lets me know tonight, it's not working through a political in a political way. It's not through a political means. Amen. We're dealing with a spiritual fight solely tonight. The seven heads, even when it was coming up out of the sea, the seven heads in that context was just trying to show us that it was Roman. It was not necessarily symbolizing something in particular at that particular time. In particular, you know, the seven kingdoms, the ten heads of uh, ten governments. But those didn't all exist at the same time in that moment. So in fact, none of them existed at one point. Right. Right. Amen. But it was telling us that this has something to do with Rome. Right. It's Roman. It's the same thing over here. Yeah. It's not saying that these ten horns and seven heads are, are in operation per se physically. Right. Right. But that there's a, there, there's a Roman spirit at work, yeah. brother. It's trying to get us to tune it. He's trying to reveal it to us. He's trying to show us what's working here. Amen. Amen. So it is Roman, but it's not political or governmental. This is a purely religious beast. This is indicating that this beast's power is a religious power. It's a spiritual power. Amen. We are not dealing tonight with political pagan Rome as long gone. We're not dealing with 
political papal Rome. But all oh, the religion of the Catholic Church, the beast of the Catholic Church, is alive and well tonight. And it's alive and well in what calls itself the Church of God. It originates from the wicked minds of men. And it is just as apostate today as it was when it rose out of the sea in 270. Listen, this beast was nothing more than backslidden church of God. In reality, it was nothing more than backslidden church of God. And this beast right here is the same thing. It's backslidden church of God. All right. Let's skip down to verse number eight here. We'll come back to these scriptures later on this week. This eighth beast, this system, is carrying what we know as the church of God. I said, don't fight it tonight. Don't fight it tonight. Don't fight it tonight. You got to pray about it. Pray about it. You got to get before God, but don't fight it tonight. Don't fight what you don't see. Don't fight what you don't understand. Amen. Ask God to help you tonight. Amen. If, 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 if we're wrong, then brother, you ain't got nothing to worry about tonight. You don't have to get upset. You don't have to get out here, slam the door. You don't have to pull me in the back room tonight. Amen. You can go on your merry way and say the church of God is as glorious as she's ever been right now. She's in the best shape I've ever seen. If you want to believe that, God bless you tonight. But that's not the message of the hour. That's not the message of the hour. This A B system is carrying, it's a system, and listen to me, it is a system tonight. It is a system of men tonight. The church of God that we know, and listen, I understand the pure, the pure church of God tonight. I know there's a pure bride, don't get me wrong tonight. So what, I am talking about what represents itself as the church of God is run, controlled, governed, amen, by men. It doesn't matter if you have a calling to the ministry or not. If they say no, it's no. They won't use you. They'll sit on you. Brother, they won't recognize you. Amen, brother. You can have scripture. You can raise the dead, brother. You can have blinded eyes. Be old, and they ain't going to put you in the pulpit, brother. Amen. It's fallen into the hands of men. Why? How do you know? Question them. Challenge them. Ask a question if you dare. Your standing in the congregation is in jeopardy. You keep fooling around like that. I'm the God called, God sent, God anointed minister. If you touch the ministry, amen, if you're touching the man of God. And brother, fear, fear, fear. It's run by men. It's governed by men. They will not recognize what God is recognizing. Amen. It doesn't, they will, they will quench the word and the spirit. And I have gone to ministers with scripture, brother. With scripture. They won't even open the Bible. They won't even go there, brother. Amen. They're not interested. You are not allowed to challenge the status quo. It's a system they have in place. It's amazing who gets the pulpit and who doesn't. You got people up there with no call. No anointing whatsoever. Don't even know the scriptures hardly. Can't preach themselves out of a wet paper bag, brother. And they'll serve you up at the meeting. Why? Loyal. Loyal to the men in charge. God didn't call them. God didn't put his hand upon them. Amen. But they'll write them a check every year. But you'll have a brother there with a call. You'll have a brother been had his nose in the book, been before God. God put his hand upon him. But because he challenges the system, they'll never touch him. I know what I'm talking about tonight. Listen, this ain't theory tonight. This is not theory. And, brother, it's time to rip the cloak off this. It's a beast. It's of the devil. It's not of God. The word of spirit God and the spirit of God's not down there. Amen. And, brother, it's just as much babbling as Corner Baptist Church, as St. John's Cathedral tonight. Brother, it's the same spirit that caused that to be 
be what it was. Amen. It is being influenced in that which calls itself the church of God tonight. This system is blaspheming God. That's why it has a name of blasphemy. Just like they did. Amen. A name. But I remember. Remember, John saw this already. But he had to be revealed this. He had to be shown that this was a name of blasphemy. What? How? How are they blaspheming? Claiming to be the people of God. Claiming to be holy. Claiming to be filled with God's Holy Spirit. Claiming divine healing. Claiming to have the truth. Amen. And it is nothing more than a system. They don't have it down there at all, brother. But they go on claiming to be God's people. Blaspheming. In that day, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, Amen, we're going to eat our own bread. We're going to wear our own apparel. But we want to still be called Church of God. We still want to be called Church of God. What? Take away our reproach. You can't call me not saved. You can't judge me. You can't say, Brother, I'm not. The Word of God's telling me what you are, and your fruit is telling on you. I don't judge you tonight. I'll let the word of God, I'll lay that on you. Amen. It'll tell me exactly what you are tonight. And furthermore, the saints shall judge the earth. The earth. Amen. Amen. These are systems of men. Systems run by men. This eight beast has every spirit of every beast down through the annals of time. Paganism. There were four beasts before Christ even came. The spirit of paganism. Amen. They didn't worship the one true God. Amen. They didn't like the people of God. They wouldn't accept the God of, the, of Israel, brother. Amen. Then we got this old dragon. What is that pagan spirit? The spirit of unbelief. Oh, it's the very spirit of unbelief. They don't believe God's word. And I'm, I am convinced there are people tonight, even in the church of God, they really don't believe the word of God, brother. They don't regard it. They don't care. They've got their own ideas, they got their own way of doing it, and don't you touch it. They don't believe the Christ, they don't believe that this truth is the only truth. Everything today is just, well, that's just your idea, that's just your interpretation. Listen to me tonight, brother. We better know what God meant when he wrote it. God did not write this word and say, you interpret it how you want to interpret it. You get to interpret it. No, he had an intention. He had something in mind when he wrote it. And we are obligated tonight to know what God meant when he said it. Why? Because when we go stand face to face before God in the judgment, we're not being judged on how you interpreted it and how you interpreted it. God's going to say, no, 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 no. It's going to be how I meant it. It's how I meant it. Amen. But that's why we better make sure we're up under the word of God and the spirit of God. We better have the spirit of God, amen, witnessing to our hearts, brother, and not a man saying, oh, ain't nothing wrong with that. Amen. And you're okay, sweetie. Amen. Brother, I'm going to the judgment. I need to know what God feels about it. Amen. All these ideas and all these opinions, amen, brother, would be eradicated if more people would just seek what God felt about some things. There's some relationships people wouldn't even be in. There's some places people wouldn't even be going. Amen. There's some things they wouldn't even have in their home. Amen. There's some things they wouldn't even entertain themselves with, brother, if they cared more about what God thought than what the preacher thought tonight. I don't know how long I've been going. All right. Pray for us tonight. Amen. The spirit of papalism's alive. Worshiping men. Chaining the word of God to the pulpit. I know not physically tonight. And brother, that word's chained. There's some scriptures some ministers won't even touch. There's some forbidden scriptures. Amen. There's some forbidden. There's some things they're not allowed to preach. They'll lose their congregation, brother. Brother, they'd be out of a check. Amen. There's some camp meetings they wouldn't be allowed. They would not be welcomed at. No more, brother. Listen. I know tonight that in the, in the religious world, we have, we have picked them apart for people having the church of their choice. Brother, you have the church of God of your choice tonight. If you want it loosey-goosey, there's a church for you tonight. 
Yeah, but if there's, if, uh, listen, if you want a place where you can do whatever you want to do and no one's going to say nothing about it, there's a church There's a church of God for you tonight. If you like it kind of strict and tight, amen, only want to wear black and white, there, uh, listen, there's a flavor for you tonight. If you have a certain doctrinal persuasion, amen, this one gets touchy, amen, but there's one for you tonight, amen, and you, listen, it's, it's, it's the 31 flavors. Of the Church of God tonight. How dare we pick on the Baptists and the Methodists? And, you know, we got the same thing, brother. And people are choosing to sit up under less than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Not only papalism, they're they're exalting men. They're exalting men, brother. They are exalting ministers. Some of them been dead, and they're still. Exalting them. Well, brother so and so didn't do that. Well, brother so and so didn't say that. Listen, as much as I may respect brother so and so, and I I can believe with all my heart he was a good man of God, he was not infallible. I'm not infallible. Amen. No human being is infallible. And brother, they could have been wrong on some things and even been clear with God. And been right with, but I can't take the wrong because brother so and so was wrong. If God shows me something that's right, brother, I gotta do what's right. And I can still have confidence in brother so and so and still do what's right. Amen. All right, Protestantism. There's that flavor. Holding men's opinions and ideas above the word of God. Listen, this is, this is what's so deceptive. You could even be lost by exalting a true doctrine. Because you might be right on that doctrine, brother. And if somebody else has got the same viewpoint that you do on that doctrine, whether their spirit's off, regardless of what else they may be doing, you'll buy and sell with them. Because you have the same mark. That's what Protestant looks for. That's what Protestantism looks for. They look for a mark. And if we have the same character, whether it's the standard, whether it's how we baptize, whatever, brother. And there's a right way to apply all of that. I'm not negating any truth tonight. But, brother, you can, you can, be, you can have truth and not have the spirit of God tonight. You can, you can have a true understanding of a doctrine tonight and not have the spirit of God. And you'll look for that mark before you'll look for the spirit of God. And that's why we're in the mess we're in tonight, Church of God. If you agree with me on this doctrine, then we're good to go. He's a good, he's a good brother. He's going to come hold me a meeting. Amen. I appreciate him. But, brother, let somebody else who has the Spirit of God maybe not agree with you on that doctrine. Amen. And you won't touch him with a ten-foot pole, brother. We better look, we better look for the fruit first. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. That was first before we ever came to the unity of the faith. Yeah, yeah, Revelation 17, let me try to wrap this up. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into per perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the, Lord, of the world when they beheld the beast that was and is not and yet is. So that lets me know this beast was working in the past. It was working then, and it will continue to work. Here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. There are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is. The other is not yet come. There were seven periods. There were seven ages. This is talking about spiritual power, spiritual ages, spiritual kingdom. Five had fallen. That meant... Uh, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, those had gone. Okay. When this beast was being revealed, it was coming on the scene, it was being shown around the sixth seal. Okay. It is. The one to come is right here in this last age. All right. The other is not yet come. So this was in the beginning of the evening time that he was being shown this. Laodicea had not yet come. All right. 
There are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, the other is not yet come. When he cometh, he must continue a short space, meaning this is the last time. This is it, a short time, and then we're going off into eternity. This beast goes into perdition. This beast goes into perdition. And what's the seriousness about it? We got souls. There's not another age coming, brother. If they don't get delivered from this beast, it's it. Because Jesus is coming back. Because Jesus is coming back. The beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth. And is of the seven. And goeth into perdition. So, brother, this has elements of every beast that's ever come against the church. But again, we're not dealing with a, a, a political ruler or, or something physical or tangible. There's no crowns on this, brother. We're dealing with spiritual powers, religious spirits. The ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, letting us know we're dealing with something Roman, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. Lord willing, we'll break some more of that down as we go through this next couple days these have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast I want you to notice tonight it took a divine revelation of this beast I remember about five years ago I began to study these truths study this word and the shudder that came over my spirit said, oh, Lord God, you mean you want us to cry that the church of God is battling this beast? That what I know of it to be, what has represented itself as the church of God. I'll tell you what happened. I read a book about some of the old six-field brethren, and that messed me up, brother. I was just, because I looked at what they were calling people out of. And, brother, what they were calling people out of looked an awful lot like what I was in. Those six field brethren didn't call sinners out of Babylon. I realized they were calling saints of God out of Babylon. People who were holy, living right, living clean, pure. And what a message for that those brethren to go have to preach. You're living holy, check. You got truth, check. But here's pure light. You got to come out of that. Amen. You got to come out of sectism. You got to come out of what is this Protestant de denominationalism and groupism and creed and be the, just the family of God. You're not a Methodist. You're not a Baptist. You're not this. You're that. You are a saint. And all the saints should be together. I wasn't seeing that. I see fellowships, groups. And it looks just like Protestantism. And this eighth beast, and we'll cover it some more, it ascended out of the bottomless pit. Listen, when those morning time brethren cast that dragon into the bottomless pit, and they found it for a thousand years. But when that thing came up out of the pit, it didn't come out as a dragon. Remember, it looked like a lamb. It was the dragon. It spake. It had every. It had the spirit of the dragon, but it looked like a lamb. It looked Christian. It looked like it was of Christ. And brother, we're dealing with a Protestant spirit tonight. This eighth beast ascended out of the same place that beast did. It has the nature of Protestantism. We are in the age tonight of Church of God Protestantism. We are in the age of Church of God Protestantism. As I close, as far as we're going to get, I believe, let me just present one last thought to you. If someone was not saved in 1850, we would preach repent and get saved. And if someone was also not saved in tonight, 2023, we would preach the same message, right? Repent. If we have the same condition that we had prior to 1880, a Protestant condition, why would we preach a different message than what was preached then? Some people say, well, brother, I don't see a second come out message. Do you see similar conditions? If there's similar conditions, we need a similar message. Listen, we can prove this, 
the second gathering and the come out message. But above all that, just look at the condition. We need a ministry that will speak to you. That's the burden of crying out against this eighth beast is to speak to the condition. I believe the Holy Ghost has us holy right there. May God bless you, Jesus.